He's here. He is here. Praise His name. He is here. Worship Him. here. He is here. Come on and worship him. Worship him. He's here. He is here. Magnify. Magnify his name. Take it up. For being here this morning we want to thank everyone for being here this morning and we just want to just praise God because we could have Chicago weather but praise the Lord we have the Sun so that we want to just clap our hands and say thank you God so as our customs we're going to start with Psalms 100 and Psalms 100 reads Make a joyful noise. Come on now. Come on now. All right, all right. And the truth endure through all generations. All right, all right. Now, now, shall we do Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that was in thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in the midst, and blessed the Sabbath day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Amen. Amen. I was saying before we pray, I was saying, um, you know how people say, thank God it's Friday? 
So we're going to say thank God it's Sabbath. Amen. Amen. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our dear loving and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for being here this day. Lord, we want to just praise you because, Lord, we didn't have to get up this morning, Lord, but you touched us, and for that we want to say thank you. Lord, thank you for each and every family member that's, that's represented here, Lord. Bless them and keep them. Lord, forgive us for our sins and our shortcomings. And Lord, we'll be so ever be mindful to give you the praise and honor and the glory because you deserve it. In your name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I guess we need to pop right back up again <laughs> because it is time for our hymn of praise. And I'm not sure, did you guys get that on the screen? Lift every voice and sing, amen. Our black national anthem, and you know we always stand for that. Amen. Now let's see if we can do a little bit better with that than we did on Psalms 100 this morning. All together now. Lift every voice. And if you can enlarge it just a little bit, I know we should all know this song by memory by now. We've been singing it for a hundred years, amen. But let's see if we can enlarge that just a little bit. God of our weary years. God of our weary years. God of our
Amen. How's everyone doing this morning? Did you come to praise the Lord this morning? It's time for our praise and worship, amen? And this is the part of the service that everyone can participate in, amen? The song says, everybody clap your hands, amen? Come on and sing it with us. We praise you. We praise you, O Lord. Come on and sing it with us if you know it. We worship you. We worship you, O oh Lord. We magnify your name. We praise you. We praise you, O oh Lord. Come on now. We magnify your name. We worship you. We worship you, O oh Lord. We magnify your name. We praise you. We praise you, oh Lord. Come on, you know this song. We magnify your name. We worship you. We worship you, oh Lord. We magnify your name. Come on and sing, everybody. Everybody, clap your hands. Everybody, clap your hands. Everybody, clap your hands. Everybody, clap your hands. This is the way. This, this is, is the way, way we praise you. Clap your hands. This is the way we praise you. Clap your hands. This is the way we praise you. Clap your hands. This is the way we praise you. Come on, we pray. We praise you. Come on, let's stand up and sing it with us. Come on. We magnify your name. Come on and worship him with us. We worship you, O Lord. We magnify your name. We praise you, O Lord. Come on. We praise you, O Lord. Come on and sing it with us. We magnify your name. We worship you. We worship you, O Lord. We magnify your name. Everybody, come on. Everybody, clap your hands. Everybody, clap your hands. Everybody, clap your hands. Everybody, clap your hands. This is the way. This is the way we praise you. Clap your hands. This is the way we praise you. Clap your hands. This is the way we praise you. Clap your hands, this is the way we praise you. Clap your hands. Wait a minute. I don't see everybody in here singing. I got a question for you. Did you come to praise the Lord? Did you come to praise the Lord? Well, I want to see everybody stand up to your feet. If you came to praise the Lord and you didn't just come to watch, I want to see you stand to your feet and sing it with us. Amen. We're here to praise God. Amen. Let's sing. Everybody clap your hands. Come on. Everybody, Everybody clap your hands. Everybody clap your hands. Everybody clap your hands. Everybody clap your hands. This is the way. This is the way we praise. The Bible said, clap your hands. This is the way we praise you. Clap your hands. This is the way we praise you. Come on and clap your hands. Clap your hands. This is the way we praise you. Clap your hands. This is the way we praise you. Clap your hands. This is the way we praise you. Clap your hands. This is the way we praise you. Amen. Song says you are Alpha and Omega. We worship you. You are worthy to be praised. Amen. Goes like this. You are Alpha and Omega. We worship you, 
our God. You are worthy to be praised. You all know this song? Sing it with us. You are Alpha and Omega. We worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to be praised. Let's sing that again. You are Alpha. You are Alpha and Omega. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. You are worthy. You are worthy to be praised. We give you all. We give you all. We give you all the came here today to worship him. We were to worship him and we, we know worship will be acceptable in his sight because the spirit is with us. At this time I just want to say happy Sabbath. Amen. Happy Sabbath and welcome to everyone here this week. Today, this week we had a, we had a, it was a historic week for us this week. We had cold weather that we've never had before. See, I'm from Jamaica, and we don't have those kind of weather in Jamaica at all. And you are from here, and you don't have this kind of weather all the time either. So, but God has been good to us. He has been good to us. No broken pipes and no issues. So that is really amazing. And that's why we're here to worship him today. And this is so good to see each and every one. You know, amongst us today, we have some visiting guests. We have, I see three individuals. Our visiting guests, can you just stand and uh, just so we can acknowledge you? All for visiting guests. All right. So good to have you worshiping with us today. Uh, we don't have much to give you, but we know the Lord has great blessings in store for you. And you will be blessed today because when you're in the presence of God, he always gives you something to take back with you that you're going to need for the week, for the year, and what's going to help you for a lifetime. And those of you who are joining us online, we are 
Uh, Sadden that you're not here worshiping with us, but we are glad that you are still tuning in and worshiping with us today. And we know that the Lord has a blessing for you as he has for each and every one of us here today. New Jerusalem, at this time, we're going to sing our welcome song and we're going to greet our visiting guests at this time. Glad you came to be a part of our fellowship to experience this awesome move of God. time if there are any anyone with announcements can come at this time so this evening at three or at five o'clock sister Cummings would like all the children back here where they have a project to work on they're gonna make gingerbread gingerbread houses they can take their houses with them and they can eat them as well so please All right, so 5.30, Chil please, uh, children, come back here um, where you can have fun with the other children. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. There will be a Sabbath school council meeting on the second Sunday of this month which is February the 10th. And I'm looking forward to seeing all Sabbath School Council members to be present at 10 a.m. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. All right, if there are nobody else for announcements, at the back of your bulletin, there are several announcements, so please take note of those. And as uh, Jamal mentioned that today, <coughs> is uh, the first Sabbath in uh, February, and February is Black History Month. You know, there's some great things that our black brothers and sisters did. Um, they did some great things. You know, they invented some things which have changed the world, changed lives, made our lives better. Not just black folks, but for everybody. 
And so we need to um, be proud of who we are as a people. We need to know who we are as a people, know our history. And the reason why we need to know our history is if we know the history, we will not make the same mistakes. And then we will also be encouraged by the things that our forefathers did and, um, and be proud of who we are. Sometimes, you know, we may feel like other people may want us to feel like because of the color of our skin, we are not, you know, up to par with everybody else. But it's not the truth. It's not the truth. And as Christians, we should know who we are. We should respect all people for who they are. And this is a month as well where not only historical figures, we, need to, we don't need to just teach our children uh, or, or remind them or ourselves about historical figures, but even our own families. Some of our children don't know the great thing that their great-grandparents and their great-great-grandparents did. You know, and so we need to uh, revisit our family history because I'm sure there are some things in there that we can be proud of. Amen? Amen. At this time, I just, uh, I would ask the children to come forward for Children's Chapel as um, the service will continue as printed in the bulletin. Good morning, boys and girls. Looks like the boys are starting to outnumber the girls at New Jerusalem. <laughs> well, it's good to see all of you today, this morning. How many like animals? Everybody likes animals, except for one, okay?
Okay, so Alyssa said her brother likes animals so much he has a zoo. <laughs> so you want to share some of those animals you have with us? I have a tiger, an arctic wolf, a jaguar, a hyena, a lion, a cheetah, red fox, Falcon, bald eagle, wolverine, bears. Good googly muggly. <laughs> Remind me not to come to your house. <laughs> wow. So in other words, you love animals. Well, we're going to talk about a boy named William and his reckless BB gun. Has anybody ever seen a BB gun? When I was a kid, that was really popular. What does BB gun shoot out? BBs. BBs. Huh? BBs. BBs. And what do BBs look like? They don't shoot out bullets, right? A little like Nerf guns when they shoot out bullets. Okay, well, BBs are very, very tiny. But BBs can do a lot of damage. Now, my brothers, one of my brothers had a BB gun, and he was always getting in trouble with that BB gun, shooting at stuff that he shouldn't shoot at. Of course, we wanted to shoot it too, my sister and I, but he wouldn't let us shoot the BB gun. But those, those guns, those little tiny BBs don't look like they could do anything, but just sting you a little bit, but they really can't do a lot. So let's talk about William. I'm not William, did I say William? I meant Mitchell. So young Mitchell, he ran through the woods armed with his new BB gun, walking through the bushes for easy targets. He was shooting at everything he could possibly see. His first BB whizzed through the trees and landed quietly somewhere in the cushion of old leaves. I missed, he said. But then he kept on shooting. He shot at trees and fallen branches, and in the distance, he began to hear a little blink while his BB was hitting rocks. And on this quiet afternoon, no one was around, and so Mitchell was having a good time shooting at everything that he could. But suddenly, he heard a soft rustle in the branches overhead. A clump of thick green leaves wiggled for a few seconds. Thwack! Mitchell shot into the leaves and waited to see what would happen next. He strained to see, and guess what he saw hanging from a tree? It was an animal a squirrel's tail, and the squirrel's tail was, tail was dripping with blood. That means that BB hit him, right? Oh no, I killed a squirrel, Mitchell, Mitchell's heart sank. He stared up into the trees for a few minutes and then he started home, ashamed that he had been so mean. Now one of God's animals was dead. Mitchell Bush is a Native American. He's from a tribe. And his parents always taught him to respect life. Not only human life, but animals, fish, birds, and even plants. He had never wanted to hurt anything. After shooting that poor squirrel, he made up his mind he would be more careful. Mitchell really loved animals. And as a growing child up on the Indian Reservation in New York, when the dogs would try to find and kill baby rabbits, guess what Mitchell would do? He would grab those baby rabbits and he would protect them. He would hide them. He cared for the baby rabbits by feeding them milk from an eyedropper. He felt happy because he was doing his part to protect them from danger. When he grew up, Mitchell still cared for the animals and the trees. He taught people about the Americans, American Indians, and how to take care of nature. His family is from the beaver clan. So it's not surprising that beavers are his favorite animals. Who knows a little bit about beavers? They have teeth that never stop growing, orange teeth that never stop growing. Um, their fortress is um, strong enough to protect them from bears. And whenever they have trouble and they're not in the fortress, they slap their tail to warn other beavers that to warn them that a predator's coming. Amen. All right, Marquis. 
That was good information. I didn't know that. <laughs> they, they use their teeth to chop wood and eat wood. Okay, yeah, because that's good, Marquis, because one of the main things you notice on a beaver when you look at him is his what? His two big teeth in the front, right? So they must be pretty strong teeth. So beavers are hard workers, Mitchell explains to people who are curious. They work and work and work. Beavers make dams and ponds, and this is very important. The ponds become homes for herons and geese and ducks and fish. Farmers and humans sometimes try to get rid of beavers. They shoot or trap the animals for their thick brown fur. Mitchell, however, works to see that they aren't all hunted down. Mitchell's family always helps the beavers by protecting its home, the beaver, the beaver colony. Other animals receive care and protection from Mitchell's neighbors and friends. They provide homes for animals and birds by allowing grass and bushes to grow, making a place for them to live. When harvesting plants, they make sure not to take all of that, all of one kind, but always leave some um, so more plants can grow. So an important lesson the American Indians teach about nature is that man is the worst enemy of clean air, clean water, animals, and pretty trees and bushes. Most people just don't care about nature, Mitchell said to a friend once. It's a shame to see people throwing trash out of car windows. I believe a lot are guilty of that. And instead of thinking only about what we need and want, we must think about others, Mitchell says. He was taught to think about his children, his grandchildren, and his great-grandchildren when he has to cut down trees or throw out trash. So we can all take care and take some care of our environment, right? And when we recycle trash and protect animals, we're thinking about the children who will someday want thick woods to play in and green grass to roll on. They'll want beavers to watch and squirrels that scamper about. So what do you think this story is telling you this morning about the environment that we live in? No pollution. Good. What else? Care about other things than yourself. Very good. What else? Don't have BB guns. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Okay. To protect our environment and be kind to our environment. Because who made the environment? Who made the grass, the trees? God. God made it. So we want to keep it very, very beautiful, right? Now, I want you to think about this. Are there ways that you can be more careful around your house? Things you could do to protect, keep things nice at your house? Don't throw trash out like my dad. <laughs> okay. Don't throw trash out. And we know that your dad puts the trash in the trash can when he throws it out. <laughs> okay. That don't throw, and that's a good lesson for all of us. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and so what I want you to do this book this week, I want you to read a book this week on the environment, and then I want you to write down ways that you can help care for God's earth. How many can do that? Do you have a library at school you can go to? You got a book. Can your parents take you to the library? I want you to go find a book about the environment and how we can take care of the environment. And before we have our prayer, I want to have, I got one question I'm really curious about. All those animals you have at your house, are they live or are they not? They're live animals. Oh, not live, thank God. Okay, let's stand for prayer. You all have been great this morning. Let's give them a great big round of applause. Who would like to pray? Dear Father, thank you for the day. I hope we have a great service, and I hope and I hope we never stop learning about you. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, happy Sabbath. Would you please stand for our scripture reading? We'll be found in 2 Samuel 21, verses 15 through 17. That's 2 Samuel verses, chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. This will be a responsive reading. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed the faint. All together. But Abishai, the son of Zeruah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of the Israel. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearers, readers, and doers of his holy word. Sabbath. God is good all the time. Yes, we serve a awesome, mighty God. Even when things look impossible, our God is awesome. This morning, I am a little bit shaken up shattered but I still trust God it's not easy to wake up five o'clock in the morning to get a bad news but our God is still in control and this morning we are here to give him the praise and the glory because he deserves it Things may not work out how we plan, but God is still God, and he's still in control. So let us pray. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You are the God who we put our trust in. You are the God who specializes in the impossible things. You are the God who never changes. And so this morning, we, your children, are privileged, we are honored to be in your presence because you have given us another chance. We come, Lord, with our brokenness, knowing that you are the potter and we are the clay, 
and you can put us back together again. We thank you, Lord, for your mercies and your grace toward us. We don't deserve it, Lord. But you see it fit to give us another chance, and we praise you. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done for us, all that you are doing for us, and all that you are going to do for us. You are God and God alone. And no matter what, Lord, you are still in control. Lord, we come because you invite us to come. You say, come unto me, all you are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You say, come and let us reason together. Lord, we cannot do this by ourselves. We need you, Jesus. We need you now more than ever. Lord, continue to lead in our life. Help us, dear Lord, that as we go from day to day, we will be the representative of you that you want us to be. We are living in the hand time, Lord, and many things are happening. Seems like we are living the job experience again, dear Lord. Before one thing is over, another thing come. But Jesus, we trust you. And we ask that you will please increase our faith in you. That we can stand like the three Hebrews boys and say, even if Jesus, even if you doesn't come true the way we want it, Lord, we trust you. We trust you, Jesus, because you are God. You never change. You never change, Jesus. You know the beginning to the end and the end to the beginning. You have everything under control. So help us, dear Lord, not to get cold feeted. The enemy is wrought, but he is a defeated foe. And we claim the victory in the mighty name of Jesus. You already won the victory, Jesus. Help us to walk in the victory. Encourage us, Lord. And help us to help others too. So that they can walk in the victory. That Prince Emmanuel, our reigning king. Our sympathizing Jesus, our intercessor, who even right now you are pleading on our behalf. Oh Lord, your blood, your blood never lasted power. You are still there pleading, showing your father your hand. I said, those are my children. My blood is sufficient for them. Oh, God, we love you and we trust you. And we just ask that you will continue to be with us. Lord, today is a day that you have set aside for mankind to come and worship you. Lord, you know from beginning that we would get weary and tired. You know that we need each other. And so, Lord, you have set aside this day so that we can come and worship you and fellowship one with another. The enemy, Lord, is trying to steal our joy, but we trust you, Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you will please unite us. Unite us so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil, dear Lord. Lord, the world is looking on. We are a spectacle to angel and to man. Help us, Lord, not to disappoint you. Jesus, please, we are begging you, we are beseeching this morning for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit in our life so that we can live above sin. Oh, Lord, help us, Jesus, to walk faithfully, truthfully, as we represent you as we go. You are a God of the impossible. There is nothing too hard for you to do. 
I saw Jesus this morning as brethren, as friends. We come together in your presence in New Jerusalem Church. Lord, you see and you know everything that is going on. But Lord, help us to be reminded that you are the leader. You are in control. And when the devil tries to destroy, Lord, you will build up a standard. You will be there, dear Father, because no one, no one can destroy your church. Because this church is built on you, Jesus. And we trust you, Lord. And that's why we are here to praise you this morning. The devil is a liar. And we bow him in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is against you, Satan. The blood of Jesus is against you. You are a loser. We are God's children. God said we are the apples of his eyes. He loves us so much. You love us so much, Lord, that you gave your life for us. What will we give for Jesus this morning? Are we willing to give up everything for Jesus? Lord, please help us. Anything and everything that is within any one of us, even right now, Lord, that will hinder our praise from being ascending up to you as sweet-smelling incense. Jesus, we are asking you, please, to remove it from us. Lord, you deserve all the glory. You deserve all the praise. So help us, Lord, to give the praise to you a hundred percent. Lord, continue to keep us in the hollow palm of your hand. Unite us again, dear Father. As a chain, dear Lord, let none of the link be missing. Where we are weak, Lord, we ask for your strength. We ask, Lord, because we know we cannot do it by ourselves. But nothing is impossible for you. And so we praise you. We put our trust in you. We put our faith in you. We put our confidence in you. Because you never lost a battle. Lord, we are so blessed. We are so privileged. Many, dear Lord, many do not have the privilege that we have to be worshipping and molested. Lord, we thank you and we have that you will help us to make the best of it. Because we know the time is coming, Lord, when we won't be here. We won't have this privilege. Children of God, let us be careful. Let us look to God, knowing that this privilege won't, be la won't last forever. It won't last forever, Lord. But our relationship that we have with you, it will last forever. So, Lord, we trust you and we ask that you just continue to lead and help us to follow. Lord, bless us as a church family. Bless us as friends. Help us, dear Lord, to continue to reach out for each other. Lord, we need each other. No man is an island and no man stands alone. We cannot do it by ourselves. We need the prayers of those we love. And so, Lord, help us to pray for each other. Not only when things are bad, but when things are good, dear Lord. We need to pray for each other. Oh, Lord, this morning we come. You are the great physician. Yes. You are the sympathizing Jesus. You are the healer. You are the balm in Gilead. And you see our shortings, Lord. Once they used to worship with us, but because of illness, dear Lord, they are not here right now. I pray, Holy Father, that you will reach out your hands of mercy to them even right now. 
that you will touch them, dear Lord, and remind them that you are still in charge and that you are with them. And Lord, if it is your will, please restore them back to health. And if not, Lord, just as all you said to Peter, your grace is sufficient, let your grace suffice them there, Father. We pray for the two brothers that have surgery. Lord, we ask that you will continue to be with them and restore them back according to your will. Lord, we don't have much to give, but we give you our heart today. We ask that you will break it, mold it, and fashion it anew so that we will worship you continually. Lord, I pray for the speaker this morning. He's your manservant. Lord, you have given him another opportunity to stand on your behalf. Lord, help us not to see Helda White, but help us to see Jesus. Help us not to hear Elder White, but help us to see, hear Jesus, because these words are yours. And may they fall on the fleshy part of our heart. And may we not only be hearers, but may we be doers, that your name will be glorified. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing that you have given to us right now. And we ask you, Lord, as we receive, help us to share it as we go. For we ask all these and we tell you thanks in the mighty and precious name of Jesus, our Lord and soon coming Savior. Amen. Amen. know that Jesus is a giver. Amen? Amen. He gave his all on Calvary's cross. What can we give in return for the blessing he has given us? Give our mind, body, soul. What about our finances? Uh, Second Corinthians it is a, the ninth chapter and verse seven says, every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly of necessity, for God loveth a cheer for giver. Amen. If writing a check, please make it out to New Jerusalem Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let's go on the screen, no? Okay. For our internet worshiping family, please go to www.newjerusalemsda.org. Then go to the online giving tab where you will be directed to return tithes, give offerings, or provide a donation. And we thank you for your giving. We ask now the deacons and ushers to come forth and lift this morning's tithes and offerings. Tragedies are commonplace. All kinds of diseases, people are slipping away. Economies down, people can't get enough pay. But as for me, all I can say is thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. Hey, yeah, yeah. Oh. Folks without homes, living all in the streets. 
having drug habits, some say they just can't beat home oh, muggers and robbers. No place seems to be safe. But you've been my protection every step of the way. And I want to say thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. Hey, 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 it could have been me. Thank you. Outdoors, you. with no food and no clothes, you. or just alone, without a friend, you. or just another number, you. with a tragic end, you. sing with us, but you couldn't Lord, be fit to you. let none of these things be, but every day of your power, you, you keep on keeping me. And we want to say thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord for all you've done for me. Yeah, 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 it could have been me. Thank you. I'm done with no food and no clothes. Thank you. Or just alone without a friend or just another number. With a tragic thank end, you, but you didn't Lord, see fit to you. let none of these things thank be. You. But every day of your power, you. you keep on keeping me. Thank you. And I want to say, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. All you've done for me. And I want to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all. I want to thank you for your love. I want to thank you for your power, Lord. I want to thank you for protecting me, Jesus, every hour. I want to thank you for your love. I want to thank you for your power, Lord. I want to thank you for protecting me, Jesus, every hour. I want to thank you for your love. I want to thank you for your power, Lord. I want to thank you for protecting me, Jesus. Every hour, I want to thank you for your love. I want to thank you for your power. I want to thank you for protection. Oh, oh, thank you. the tithe to the storehouse that there may be meat in my house yeah. said the Lord of hosts and prove me now he will say the Lord of hosts that I, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing there shall not be room enough to receive it yeah. and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field said the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, said the Lord of hosts. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, once again, we thank you for the opportunity and to be able to give back that which you require of us, a tenth of tithe and, and a cheerful offering. We pray, Lord, may these funds go uh, to reach out in the community, touch hearts, and to further thy soon coming. In Jesus' name we pray, let our hearts say amen. amen. God bless you.
How many of y'all are grateful this morning? Clothes in your right mind. Food on your table. Clothes on your back. Amen. That's a lot to be a reason. That's a great reason to be grateful. Amen. You're here today. That's a reason to be grateful. Amen. He kept you grateful. Yes. 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 No matter what you're going through, I'm just here to encourage somebody this morning. Amen. Be grateful.
servant today not happy I would I would rather not be here but he has chosen me to be here right now and thanks be to God I know you believe everything children say I love my daughter she's my prior partner and believe me every time I'm gonna speak or do anything she comes into the office at home, and we sit down and pray. Amen. That's my prayer partner. And it's Brother Wilburn's prayer partner, too. He loves all the little kids. Whenever he's going through anything, he'd call, hey, where, 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 where are my little kids? He wants them to pray because God hears their prayers. And I just want to say, I do not throw trash all over the place. I put trash in the garbage can. That's where it should be. All right. This morning, um, to begin, I'm going to ask you to please stand as you turn with me to Joshua 7, verse 1 to 7. You see, A lot of people don't really read the Bible throughout the week. They listen to it, but they don't really read it. And so the only words that have authority today are the words of God. So everything I say, this trumps it. Everything anybody has said to you, the word of God trumps it. Amen? All right. Joshua 7, verse 1 to 7. Read, read alternate verses. Is that okay with you? I know that's not the scripture text. The scripture text today is much different. It came from somewhere, but I'm beginning with, uh, with this one. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. And Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, 
took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Alternately, and to Ai, which is beside Bethaven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men, men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua disclosed and fell to the earth upon the faith before the ark of the Lord until the even tide, he and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. Seven last, and Joshua said, Alas, O Lord, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelled on the other side of Jordan. Today I entitled my sermon, I Need You to Survive. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are a righteous God. You are the one calling your people to repentance. You are the one calling your people to salvation. Today, dear God, it's a privilege and an honor to, to stand before your people as your representative. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will speak through me. Use me, dear God, as your vessel of honor. And I pray that you will bless everyone here today. Please accept our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I need you to survive. So last December, I was privileged to have a conversation with a friend of mine who I hold in high esteem. This gentleman, he's, a, he's very articulate. He's a one-of-a-kind kind of guy. He has his own talk show. He has his own business. He has things going for him. I knew him for I know him for a couple of years, and, but I noticed that something is not too right with him. Something was off because this, the bubbly person I know, the guy who is always outgoing, he seemed kind of reserved. So I said to him, I said, "Hey, buddy, what's going on?" I said, "Man, I like you, man. I wish I was doing some of the things that you're doing." And he said to me, "Mark." I really appreciate you saying nice stuff about me and encouraging me. But the person you see is not the person I see myself to be. I said, what do you mean? I said, man, what's going on? And he went on to tell me a story. He said, Mark, I was working on a project for my company. And I taught everybody in my department the project. I taught them what to do. And my boss was super impressed with me. And so he invited the, some executives to come to their branch so they could um, see what they were doing. And so he said he was excited because, hey, this is what he loves to do. This was in his realm. This is his baby. He mastered that project. And so the day came for him to present before the executives. And so he went into the conference room early morning just to make sure that everything was OK. You know, they have these big screens in the conference room. So he went to make sure that the audiovisual equipments were working. He made sure that he was able to um, transfer images from his computer to the screen. He made sure everything was OK. He made sure that his PowerPoint was OK, that he had copies of, the report, that they, of this project that he could share with everybody. This guy was pumped. He was excited. Then he looked on the, on the agenda for the day, and he was number four to speak. And so the only thing missing at the time was for the attendees to make it to the meeting. 
So he said, the time came and everybody met in the conference room and they did their introduction. Man, these guys were, one of them was a CEO, one, was a, one of them was an executive vice president. So these were not little, um, these were not little, you know, these were very high up in the organization. And it's a very, very big company right now in the United States. Right now they're, they're worth $120 billion. That's what they're worth. So what he was doing, presenting the CEO, was special. And he said, Mark, sat in the meeting, and then for some reason, a new agenda was passed out. And guess what? He was first on the agenda to speak. He said immediately, something came over him. He said he never had that feeling before. He, he, he knew what he was supposed to talk about, but he became so nervous. His speech became blurred. He started to sweat. He started to feel like he wanted to faint. He just felt so bad. He said he looked around and he looked at his boss's face and his boss was, what? His boss, he was a white guy. He said his face was red. He said, what is going on? He looked at the CEO and the other executives and they're saying, what is this? What did, what did you invite me here for? And he said, Mark, my mind just went away from me. He said, this was the first time I wish I could disappear. I wish the earth could open and take me in. He said, I wanted, I just wanted to go. He never recovered from that meeting. He messed up royally in that meeting in front of his boss's wow. boss. That's bad when you mess up in front of your boss, but when you mess up in front of your boss's boss, that's messed up. And this incident has haunted him for years. And he's been locked up within himself. And he said to me, he said, Mark, how do you rebound and how do you make a comeback after you failed at the thing that you do best? He wasn't trying something. This was his baby. This was what he does. This was his career. But if you're like most of us, you detest failure. Everything that you do, everything that you say, it's towards success, towards achieving your goal. And failure is one of the worst feelings to experience, not to mention getting over it. It's okay to make a mistake. And sometimes we, 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 we mix up mistake with failure. You see, mistakes are wrong actions. And guess what? You can fi fix mix mistakes. But failure... Failure is the result. Failure is the end product of a bad action or a bad um, situation or a bad comment, whatever it is. You can't fix failures. You can. But the thing about failure is that you can learn from them. You can grow. You can improve. Failure is sometimes unavoidable. And there are a lot of people who've never learned how to handle and to deal with failure. There are so many people, they're locked away in the past. They cannot get over what people said, what people did. They cannot forget about circumstances. And so they're not 100% themselves. They fall down and guess what they do? They just stay there. They think that everything that they do is a failure. They become paralyzed and stuck in a moment that has passed and gone. They can get over certain things. They remember what people said. They remember what people did. They play their lives safe, and they are afraid to get up and to start over again. They are afraid to be knocked down once more or to lose. Failure is not a new phenomenon. This book here, the Bible, it's filled with lots of men and women and nations that have failed. We do things wrong sometimes. As a church, as a people, as a family, we do wrong things sometimes. But failure should not define us. Noah, he was ridiculed for a hundred years 
by the people who he was preaching with. They failed to accept the message that Noah had. And guess what happened? They died. Samson, he failed to obey the commands of God. They were outright, do not do this. I wish I knew what I should not do. Mark, do not eat this, do not touch this. I wish my life was on a platter. I wish I had a manual for my life, and I know you wish I had a manual for your life. Like that. Yes, we do, yes, we do. But like that, you know? But he had it. But guess what he did? He went astray. And because of that, guess what he lost? He lost his eyes. Moses failed. Moses should have spoken to the rock. Guess what he did? He struck the rock. Jacob, the birthright was already his. He was going to be blessed anyway. But guess what he did? He stole it. Peter. Peter denied Christ three times. He failed three times. Judas. Judas. That guy, he messed up royally. He betrayed God and he killed himself. These are people who have messed up. But you know, God says, your mess, he's able to help to clean it up. He can clean up the messes that we make. And so Moses, Moses was charged to lead the children of Israel out of bondage and lead them into the promised land. And guess what he did? He started the journey. But because Moses messed up himself along the way, the Lord said, hey, you can't finish the job for me, buddy. You can't. And when he died, Joshua, he became the commander-in-chief over Israel. And his responsibility was to pick up where Moses had left off and lead the people of God into the promised land. This was no ordinary thing for two reasons. Number one, even though they had the promised land promised to them, they had to fight to get it. It wasn't going to be handed to them. They had to work for that land. And secondly, believe it or not, church folks are, can be some of the hardest people to lead. He was leading church folks. And church folks, you cannot please them sometimes. But all in all, Joshua demonstrated to them that they can accomplish more when they work together as a team than when they work away from God, away from the principles of God. So they develop strategies, and they develop principles, and they develop laws and rules that they would um, follow God's command. And guess what? Joshua had a winning culture. Everything that Joshua did, every war that Joshua went into, guess what? He won. He won because he had God with him. And so now they had this um, little army to, to fight against, the army of Ai. And so Joshua is a man like this. He doesn't take things for granted because they had just uh, won the war against um, Jericho. And so they're saying, man, you know, some of us would be on high. We say, hey, psh, hey, if we beat Jericho, we can beat anybody else. And so Joshua said, I'm not going to take nothing for granted. I'm going to treat each war the same way. So if I'm going to fight, I need to know who I'm going to fight. What are your strategies? What are your strengths? Um, I need to know the lay of the land. How many people do I need? And so Joshua sent his men to go and check out what's going on in the place. And when they returned, they said to Joshua, not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or 3,000 men to take it and do not weary the whole army, for, there, uh, for only a few people live there. So about 3,000 went up. You see, Joshua didn't take, it, take things for granted. They said 2,000 or 3,000. Joshua said, okay, I'm going to send 3,000. This will be an easy sweep. This will be easy peasy, lemon cheesy. It will be, you know, what would take four hours to win? No, it may take three hours. My men can come back home real quick. 
But guess what happened? The men of Ai, they gave a good whooping to these 3,000 men. What happened here? It's like something went wrong because Ai, as these guys said, and Joshua believed his men. Joshua, these are spies. These, are, these guys, they know what war is. And so when they say it's just a few men, take it literally, it's just a few men. Because the, the, the army of Israel was a huge army. And so the Israelites went against Ai, and the Bible said they, they, they chased the Israelites from the gate of the city as far as the stone quarries and struck them down the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted and fear in fear and became like water. These guys were about to have a heart attack. This was the first battle that the children of Israel lost since they left Egypt. So what caused this defeat? What caused this defeat against this inferior army, against few men? The issue is it was because of sin. They lost that battle because there was a sin in their camp. You see, in Joshua 6, the Lord said, do not touch any of the accursed thing. Do not touch anything. But there is this gentleman. His name was Achan. Achan was something else. I have to tell you that sin is lethal to any Christian or to any church. When sin is present, we cannot fight the Lord's enemies and win. The prime example is seen here. Joshua was used to winning. Joshua does not lose. He was a trained warrior. He was a trained fighter. He was a trained strategist. And he was totally dependent upon God for help. So why now he has 2,964 men running down a hill like puppy dogs with their tail between their legs? What happened? Navy SEALs don't run away like that. Navy SEALs face the battle, but his Navy SEALs are running away. Achan. What happened was that Achan, he took things that he should not have taken. Achan took clothes and he took money that he should never have taken. And because of that, because of that, the Lord judged the entire nation of Israel. I know we have challenges in, the church, in this church. So the question I have to ask is, are you an Achan? Is there an Achan in this place? Are you indulging in the accursed thing? Are you lying? Are you stealing? Are you committing adultery, killing? Are you envying your neighbor? Do you have other gods beside the God of heaven? If you are, then we have a problem. Did you notice that it was just one man's sin that caused the defeat of a whole nation? One man's sin, and God judged them collectively. You see, what you do in the dark at home, yes. or in your car, yes. or in the alley, or at work, or wherever, yes. what you do when you're all by yourself yes. is our problem. Yes. Yes. It's your family's problem. Yes. It's not yours. Oh, this is just me. Hey, no way, Jose. No. What you're doing is hurting all of us we are responsible for each other and God sees us as one we say we are a family if daddy does something foolish in the family guess what's gonna happen the children are gonna feel it this wife is gonna feel it so if you do something guess what all of us should feel it as a church family we will never ever win we will never grow if we too have sin in our lives. We put everybody in jeopardy when we are doing foolish things. You see, Achan, he took the pretty clothes. He took money. It's always a problem. Always want the shiny, pretty things. God said, do not. I will take care of you. 
When we have sin in our lives, we cannot win, and neither will we experience the favor of God when sin is in our lives. So what can we do and what should we do? We need to put sin away. You know what happened to Achan? They took him outside. They killed him. They killed his wife. They killed his chicken. They killed his kids. They killed the roaches in his house. They killed the ants. They killed the flies. They killed every, every, everything. You're saying this is terrible, right? This is terrible. God is wicked. You remember a few months ago or years ago when there was Zika? Yeah. If you went to Brazil and you come back to America, hey, that entire plane is quarantined because one case of Zika can wipe out our whole country. Same thing with one sin. It can destroy all of us. So you're saying God is evil? No. Sin destroys So that was Joshua. Let's look at another guy, David. That's okay with you. Before David came on the scene of in, of in Israel's history, 1 Samuel records how the people of Israel wanted a king so that they could be like other nations. God was always their king. And they never lost when God is their king. They reign supreme when God was with them. When the presence of God is with you, you can do anything. But now they're saying, hey, we do not want God. We want somebody else. So God allowed it. And guess what? They elected a Casanova. His name was Saul. He was very good looking. Valentine's Day is coming up soon. Oh, that's the guy you want to be with. He was tall, dark, and handsome. They chose him to be their first earthly ruler. Saul had a good start. For the first year of Saul's reign, you hear nothing. He did well. He called the people to prayer. He obeyed the laws of God. Saul was responsible for drawing, for putting together the 12 tribes of Israel to make an army, a force that all the other nations had to reckon with. Saul did some great things. But at the end, he had a tragic ending. He led the Israelites to victory in many battles. He followed God's laws in the first year of his reign until he started to per personalize his achievements and allowed pride and jealousy to fill his heart. He acted foolishly and refused to align his life according to the guidelines that God had given them. Amen. And not only that, the way Saul lived his life is the way he governed the people. He was doing foolish things and he was allowing foolish things to happen and he was teaching the people foolish things. He was leading them away from God. And because of his constant failure and disobedience, God withdraw his spirit from him. When God withdrew his spirit from Saul, Saul became like a mad man. Saul was not the same. His attitude changed, his demeanor changed. Everything that Saul did was a failure because the spirit of God is not with him. We know, too, that when we are not on God's side, we do not prosper. It doesn't matter what we do. Even if we, even if we win, if we know we are doing something against God's will, it doesn't have the same feeling. It's kind of hard when you do something that's not right. You win, but you can't show it to anybody. You do something, and you're, you have to be wondering if anybody finds out. You have it, but you can't tell the real source of that income. You can't tell the real source of how you got to where you are. It's kind of shady, you know? Whenever God is not with us, we get into serious trouble. And the issue is, today, people remember 
nothing about Saul's victories, nothing. All they remember is his failures. I do not want to be remembered for my failures. In the Jerusalem family, it's not how you start. It's how you finish. Amen. It's how your life on earth ends. That is what really counts. Don't get stuck in the past. And you have to ask yourself, the things that you're doing right now, is it going to make you finish strong? Is it going to give you a positive end? Are you going to achieve your goal? I know your goal, and my goal is to make it to heaven. Are the things we're doing right now, is it going to cause us to end our life like Saul, or is it going to end up in the way that God wants it to? You see, with Saul rejected, God told Samuel it was time to find another king. His people deserved a better leader. And this time God says, you will not choose. I am going to choose. I trust when God chooses. Because when I choose, I look for the pretty. I look for the shiny. But when God chooses, he said, man, look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. You know, we just came through nominating committee and um, nominate, the nomination process. And um, I was wondering, you know, when we chose, were we looking at people's heart or were we look, looking at people for what we can see, what they can do? Or are we looking for people who are committed for Christ? Amen. People who will stick with Christ in thick and thin. Or are we looking for, you know, results? We have to choose properly whenever we're choosing. And we have to allow God to choose for us because when God chooses, he chooses the best for us. And God said, I do not want a pretty boy this time. No way. No pretty boy. I want a man after my own heart. God is looking for people after his own heart. And the successor for Saul, from Saul was David, son of Jesse. Chosen when he was just a young shepherd boy. Sometimes we don't see anything in our youth. Sometimes we see our youth as something else. But when you look at Mindy's son or my, little, my children, what do you see? You see a little troublemaker. You see a little runt, as they call him in the Bible. You see something. But God looks on the heart. And he knows that... These little young men and young women in New Jerusalem church, they are going to do great exploits for him. When you flunk or fail, these are the young people that Jesus is going to use. So young people, don't let nobody tell you that, hey, you're a troublemaker, you, you, you're good for nothing. No, God has a plan for you. That is why he has you here. He has great things for you, things that you can't imagine. See, Jesse saw his son as just a shepherd boy. Go take your sheep. Take your sheep. But God saw in him a king. A king. 1 Samuel 6 verse 18 tells us who David was. It said David was a skillful musician. He was a mighty man of valor, a warrior. He was prudent in speech. He was also handsome. And the best of all, the Lord was with him. You see, David had something special. And he had something that God wanted to use. He had something that God wanted to develop. And God wanted to work with that. You see, David also is known for killing Goliath. That's what he is known for. But before he, 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 we get to the Goliath story, David went to see his brothers. And how he got to see his brothers, his daddy sent him. His daddy said, hey, hey, come here, boy. Take this to your brothers. Your brothers are in the army. And I know they like this kind of soup. I know they like chicken wings like me. I know they like, they like some vegetarian chunks. They like some veggie meat. They like some stuff. They, I, I know they are war, but I want them to remember home. I want them to remember something good. So take this, uh, take this little food and give to them. And David was excited. Man, he gets to see to have a different scene. You know, normally he'd be taking care of sheep and 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 and, and fighting mosquitoes and doing all kind of stuff. Now he's able to go see people, real people, not just sheep. And so when David went to uh, see his brothers. 
it didn't feel like an army. He saw some fearful men. They're, he's wondering, what is going on? And then he hears this voice, Israelites, Israelites, your God is nothing. Israelites, Israelites, your God is nothing, and so are you. You little puppy dogs, come over here and fight me. And David said, what's going on here? And David says, you allow him to talk against your God? Israelites, my God is stronger than your God. Look at him. Your God is a wimp. And David said, what? And guess what? These are clean words I'm using. He used some, some crazy words to, to describe God. And David said, you are telling me that you king chosen to represent God. You people, you army chose to represent God. He's not doing anything about it. You forgot how you, he helped you to conquer Jericho. You forgot how he led you through the Red Sea, that God, and you're letting somebody talk about our God like that? They say, come on, David, come on, it's all right. We got this, we got this, we're planning. Come on, David, tell us about your, um, tell us about your, 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 how you take care of sheep. Tell us, we've never taken care of sheep. And so David says, your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion and a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, and I went after him, and he was pointed at Goliath. I, was I went after him and rescued it from his mouth. And there he rose up against me, and I seized him by the beard and struck him and killed him. You see, David could have told him, wow, you know, this morning uh, we, 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 we had three little lambs that were born, and we can use them for sacrifice. Or he could say, hey, when my daddy gave me these sheep, we started out with a hundred, and now we have a thousand. He could have said, man, we sell sheep for this price. No, no, that's not what he said. He said, when a lion and a bear came, David was in war mode. David, a different David came about because David uh, came to realize that God needs to be respected at all costs. And David said, I want to go and fight that guy. David was there uh, just thinking about what was going on. And he, he said, man, something is wrong, God. You helped me to, to, to kill a bear and a lion. No little boy killed bear and lion. lion. You see, bear and lion, they are wild animals and they destroy. But no, dear God, this man in front of us, he needs to be treated like a bear and a lion. And they, when David heard Goliath disrespecting God, he was angry. But I believe what made him more angry is when the chosen people of God were acting like cowards. They were afraid to call sin by its right name. New Jerusalem, you can't act like cowards. You're not cowards. You're God's representative. We we should cause sin by its right name. Not only on the street, but here in church, when people are messing up, when we are messing up, sin need to be called by its right name. In our home, sin need to be called by its right name. The one thing I learned from this is that if the people of God don't stand up for what is right, the voice of evil will prevail. When the people of God keeps quiet, Without, without defending the truth, what's going to happen is that David's, uh, Goliaths are going to start coming to your homes and into your church. You go home and guess what? There's a, a, a Goliath in your garage. There's a, go a Goliath in your driveway. He take over your house. He take over your land. He take over your property. He take over your businesses. He'll move in. He'll camp there. He'll steal your joy. He'll take your peace. He'll take your thoughts. When you should be praying to God, you can't even concentrate because, hey, your thoughts are on your Goliath. And that's the reason why we can't ignore Goliath. We can't ignore him in our homes. We can't ignore Goliath in our churches. We can't ignore Goliath in our homes, in, in, our, in our lives. Goliaths need to be defeated. We have to kill the Goliaths. What is your Goliath? I don't know what your Goliath is. 
But you have a Goliath. And you cannot allow that Goliath to destroy you. Goliath is coming after you. His goal is to kill you. To destroy your confidence in God. David killed Goliath. You know the story. He used a rock. A rock. A little rock to kill a giant. Rocks don't kill giants, but this one did. Rocks hurt giants, not kill giants. But because God was with David, a rock killed a giant. David used a rock. What is your rock? Is your rock to pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm sorry? Is your rock to confront somebody and say, please forgive me, I was wrong? Is your rock to treat people like people? What is your rock? Is your rock to go back home? Is your rock to, today is to follow through on whatever you need to do? I don't know what your rock is, but you know what you can do to make a situation better. You know what God can use to make a giant fall. Amen. David looked back and he saw giants um, that God had enabled him to defeat in the past. David was a little boy. Lions, when they grow big, they can be 200, 300 pounds. Bears, 500 pounds. Huge. Those are giants for David. He was a little boy. And he realized that God was the one who helped him to defeat those giants. And this gave him faith and confidence to know that God could handle this human Goliath. I don't know what Goliath you face. Could be a spiritual Goliath. Could be a legal Goliath. Could be a medical Goliath. Could be a relationship Goliath. And guess what? Like David's Goliath, our Goliath just doesn't come once. They show up every morning, at midday at lunchtime. They come in the evening. They wake you up 5 o'clock in the morning, like Sister Morgan says. They come day after day, relentlessly trying to intimidate us, trying to make our hearts melt. They never stop taunting us. What is your Goliath? What is your Goliath? What's holding you back? My brothers and sisters, don't lose hope. Seek the Holy Spirit's help. You can do this. Spirit in you, you can. You and will win your battle. Amen. Acts 1 verse 8 says, but, do, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Amen. And Romans 8 verse 31 tells us, Sister Cummings, it says, what shall we say to these things? If God be for you, Sister Cummings, who, Sister Morgan, who, Brother Brown, who, Elder Hall, Wake up, Elder Hall. If God be for you, who can be against you? No one, no Goliath, no lion, no bear shall have power over you when God is with you. As I close, David had God with him all through his life. And because of this, he has done Lots of impossible things. He is, most, he is the most well-known and well-loved Bible character next to Jesus Christ. Amen. David was a king, but he was also a ferocious fighter. He was the commander of Israel's army for many years. He was feared among the enemy nations. They know that David doesn't lose wars. In our scripture reading found in 2 Samuel 21, 15 to 17, we see David in battle. In this battle, 
there was an assassin named Ishbi Benab. He was a giant and he came to war that day with one goal in mind. He had one objective. All the other soldiers were there to fight and to, to kill and to maim and to do whatever they want. But this giant had one goal, one purpose. And that purpose was to kill King David. Don't come back home was his orders unless you come with the head of David. He was well prepared. He trained. He knew David's tactics. He studied David. He knew David's weaknesses. And guess what? He got a brand new sword with David inscribed out on it. David, king of Israel, loser. That sword, the Bible said, was a brand new sword, never used on anyone or used on anything before. That sword was specially made to kill a king. That was David's sword. That day, David was supposed to die by any means necessary. The Bible tells us something happened to David that has never happened to any other general in the Bible. In the midst of the battle, David the king, David, Israel's warrior, fainted. One version of the Bible says that David fell on his knees holding his weapons, but he could not use them. He was exhausted. Exhausted from fighting the enemies of God. That was a tactic used by the Philistines. Wear him out. Wear him out. And give benefit to Ishbenabab. And so it worked. David fell on his knees. He could do nothing. We are told that Ishbenabab realized what happened, that their tactic worked. And with David in his cross here, grave, David just a few steps away, he lifted his sword and said, thank you to his God. And said, today, I'm going to get the head of David. You see, if you kill the king, you automatically win the war. Right. Automatically king kill, yeah, win the war. And so he was thinking about the triumphant victory when they marched with David's head in their hand to put on some Philistine pole and some Philistine wall. He was hearing the people shouting, Hish, Hish bin Abab, Hish bin Abab, killer of David. Hish bin Abab. He was ready. He was going to take the kill. He was going to get David, and guess what? David was on his knees, unaware of what was going on. He pulled his sword, and out of the blues, the sun glistened, shined on his sword. And one of David's servants, Abishai, saw that and said, what's going on? There should be no sword shining right now. All swords should have blood on it. And for there should be a reflection that meant something was going down. And when he looked, he saw the giant all focused. This giant was not going to lose today. And I said, oh my goodness. And guess what he did? He went and he slew the giant. The giant didn't see what was coming. He was so focused on David's head. Abishai, Abishai. He killed a giant. How could David fail on the, on the battlefield? He knew the rules of the war. He knew never to turn his back on the enemy. He knew never to trust the enemy. He knew they had giants in, the, in, in, in their army. He knew he was a target and he should be protected. How could he fail at what he does best? 
David failed at fighting. That is what he is known for, a fighter, a warrior. But we too, you know, can feel like David, exhausted from fighting battles at church, exhausted from fighting battles on the job, exhausted from fighting battles at home, exhausted from fighting battles with sickness and illnesses, exhausted from fighting battles with our checkbook or bank account. And that's the reason why when we go to war, we can't go alone. Because sometimes we faint. And when we are left exposed to the enemy, we need each other. That's why I need you to survive. And you need me to survive. Without my brother, without my sister by my side. Without our brothers, without our sisters. We won't make it. We have some brothers and sisters who have fainted. They're exhausted. We don't know why he was, he was exhausted. My wife asked me, why do you think David was exhausted? I didn't know why he was exhausted. I knew he was fighting. Probably he was thirsty. Probably, we know he was old. Probably something happened, but he was exhausted. But it doesn't mean that the Spirit of God was not on him. Amen. We have brothers and sisters right now who are exhausted, but the Spirit of God is still with them. And guess what? They need an Abishai. They need a you. They need a you to protect them. They need a you to stand by their side and slew and slay the Goliath and, and the giants that are trying to destroy them. Sometimes we fail to see God leading in our lives. We fail to see the purpose that he has for us. Because we are not king, we think we can't do much. I remember we had a business meeting a few weeks ago. And, you know, we have an incident, we had an incident, still have it, and people are asking, Pastor, what are you doing about it? Pastor, what did you, Pastor, what about you? What are you doing about it? Do something about it. It's not the pastor's job or the elder's job, it's our job, your responsibility. We have to get in the war together. It's not David's war or the pastor's war or the elder's war. It's our war. I need you to survive. Our brothers and sisters who are fainted, who are just a little bit exhausted right now, they need you to survive. They didn't die. David didn't die. He's just exhausted. Guess what? Once he's rested, guess what's going to happen? He's going to get right back to his old self. But in that moment, he need an Abishai. Many of our members need Abishais right now. They need you. Some people give up when, they, when things don't go their way. They stop serving God. They stop coming to church. They stop communicating. One preacher said there's a lot of exhausted people in church. A lot of people tired from fighting with their children, fighting with their parents, tired of fighting with their spouses, tired of fighting in business and board meetings. They're just tired of fighting on the job. There are a lot of people who are here physically, but mentally and spiritually, they are absent. And they are helpless too. They contribute time and money to the church, but they are not grounded in the truth. They come and they leave. And we wonder why. Another preacher says, it's very expensive when you lose anyone in your church. It costs you emotionally. It costs you mentally. So losing your loved one, it's expensive. It's not that we can't survive without them. No, we can. Yes, we, we, can, we can go on. Business will go on. But the void will be there. The void will be there and nobody can fill it. It was David who said, I have been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken. 
So even though you are our, and our brothers and sisters are fainting or are exhausted, guess what? The righteous is never forsaken and you will not be forsaken. So today I have a question for you. Are you a Saul? Have you started out strong? But things are not going the way God wants them to? Well. Are, are you an Achan? Are, are you involved in things which you shouldn't be? Are you a Goliath? Are you a bear? Are you a lion? I don't know. I don't want to be an Achan. I don't want to touch of the accursed thing. I definitely don't want to be a Saul. I want to be a winner. Just like Joshua. I want to be a man after God's own heart like David. I want to be an Abishai. I want to be an Abishai. Do you want to be an Abishai? I want to be an Abishai. You are my Abishai. I need you to survive. I'm your Abishai. You need me to survive. Yes, I want to be a winner. Yes, I want to be a man after God's own heart. But most of all, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. Do you want to be like Jesus? You see, with Jesus in our lives, we will survive. Abishai saved David, but Jesus saved the whole world. Jesus is our Abishai. He said, I will never leave you, and I will never, ever forsake you. Why? Sister Morgan said it best. Because you are the apple of my eye. I know you have failed at many things. I've failed at so many things. So many things. Things I'm, I can't even tell you. So embarrassed about it. But you know what? God has not given up on me. And God will not give up on you. So today, we need each other. We need each other. You see, the family life director didn't tell me to say this but I'm gonna say something about family life right now in family life we as a department um, we have the structures a little bit different where family life has different departments that roll up into it men's ministry women's women's ministry children's ministry all these ministries roll up uh, um, senior ministry singles ministry roll up on their family life and what Family Life is doing is they're asking all the leaders, they're going to come to you, look for all the people who are not coming anymore. All the people who should be here and are not here. And let's reach out to them. We want you to be the Abishai for the Family Life Department. Amen. So today if you pledge to be an Abishai for somebody, I'm inviting you to stand with me. If you want to be an Abishai, I know many of you never hear about Abishai before, right? Never heard about that story. But we need each other. Yes, we do. Our family need us. We need to be the Abishai for our families. At home and in the church. We need each other to survive. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have failed in many things and in many ways Lord we do not want to be like Saul we do not want to start us strong but end in failure we do not want to be like Achan we do not want to be like Jacob stealing from our brothers Lord we want to be like Jesus 
Father, we want the spirit of the living God to always be on us. We want to do great exploits for you, Jesus. But without you, we can do nothing. So today, dear God, your church has failed in many ways. We haven't stand up for what is right, dear God, in certain circumstances. And because of that, dear God, we, we are punished in various ways. Lord, none of us think of ourselves as Achan. But we know when there is sin in the camp, dear God, you will not strive with us. So, dear God, we are asking you to show each and every one of us, and as a church complete, dear God, what we have done, what we need to fix. We do not have solutions, dear God, and so we are asking you, please give us the solutions, dear Father. We want your name to be glorified and lifted up. Lord, we've tried it all. We tried it all, yes. but it's not working. Yes. Lord, you're the great physician. Yes. You're the great protector. Yes. You're the great provider. Yes. And many of us, dear God, have, are stuck in the past yes. when we missed out on an opportunity. Yes. Many of us, we do not pursue our careers because we fail the test. Because we take the test three, four, five times and we fail it, but we want to be we, we see ourselves doing something. Help us, dear God, to not allow tests to define us, but may we strive and move towards our goals. Many of us have dreamed of businesses and have goals, dear God, and we start all strong, dear God, but it, it, we have fallen along the way. Many of us want to do great exploits for you. We want to go on mission trips. We want to go out in the community to tell others about you, dear God. But for some reason, we have fallen along the way. Please restore your spirit. Please restore your joy to us, dear God. And help us to know that we need each other to survive. But more than ever, we need Jesus. Thank you for this awesome day. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for the message today. And dear Father, when we leave here, dear God, may we leave here knowing that we are Abishai's. Abishai's. We are Abishai's for each other. In Jesus' name, amen.